Last time, we're going to figure out some divisibility rules. Patterns that tell us quickly if a number is divisible by some number or not. In this case, we need another 2, and that's what we're throwing into the fire. This is why we can't have 1 be a prime number, because otherwise a prime factorization won't be a unique way. What are bases? One thing you can be sure about is that all of it belongs to us. Hello Sapios, welcome back to another episode of Let's Math It Out, where the sounds of repeated smooth jazz will continue playing in the background, curling up inside your brain as a small earworm, carrying mathematical information with it that will burrow into your mind. Anyways, today we're talking about bases, and to do that we have to make one thing clear, this episode will be full of base jokes, because I can't help myself. It's all about that base, after all. So what are bases, and why do we keep dropping them? To figure out what they are, we have to remember the first episode. The episode where we talked about digits and numbers. Remember that digits are a way to represent numbers, but not the actual numbers themselves. So how do we come up with a way to represent the numbers? Just like any clever idea or invention, the main motivation was laziness. Back in the early days of, I don't know, 1500s or something? I'm a mathematician, not an anthropologic historian. We used to count with tally marks. If someone had 8 sheep, we would acknowledge this amount of sheep by putting 8 little scratches on a wooden stick. But then some rich dude came along with 26 sheep. Now what? I'm, I'm too lazy to carve 26 tally marks in a stick, so some dude or dudette or somewhere in between dude they? came up with the idea of having one stick represent 10 sheep. Probably because most human beings have 10 fingers. It actually turns out that the dominant gene in human beings is having 6 fingers on each hand, or at least that's what I was taught in high school. Again, I'm a mathematician, not a genetic biologist. So with this revolutionary technique, we can mark 2 tally marks on one stick and 6 tally marks on the other, just making sure that we don't get them confused because that means the rich dude could end up with 62 sheep and we never want rich people to get more than they already have. But all of a sudden, a new challenger approaches. A super rich dude with hundreds of sheep, like maybe like 963 sheep. Being the lazy beings we are, some dude they came up with the idea of having one more stick to represent 10 of 10 sheep, a uh, hundred sheep, you get the point. As resources grow abundant and the super rich accumulate their wealth, we have to come up with more sticks to represent the ticks on the sticks, and possibly even sticks to represent the number of sticks. The idea is that we are representing the powers of 10 with the sticks, and the number of ticks are our digits. What are the powers of 10? Well, remember what we say when we exponentiate? 2 to the power of 3, 3 to the power of 2. The powers of a number are the numbers you get when you take a number to different powers. Basically, think multiples, but we're using exponents. So, to translate the technique of the sheep counter of the 1500s, again, I don't know what I'm talking about, to today's maths, the sticks are going to be placed on paper right to left, from 1 to the next powers of 10. Remember that 1 is any number to the power of 0. And the ticks translate to the digits we use. At this point, you should be asking, why 10? 10 seems a bit arbitrary. I mean, math guy here is talking about how many fingers we have, but it still feels a bit random. And you're absolutely right, you should be asking this question because, first of all, there are so many other bases we can use. In fact, you're using another base right now and you don't even know it. To be more precise, you're watching this video on some sort of electronic device. And I guarantee you, at the time of the publication of this video, that your device is using a binary base. Binary. Binary. Think by sickle, not the playing cards, but the thing you ride around. How many wheels, or cycle, does it have? 
two. And that's right, bi means two. Just like bisect means you're separating something into two and biology means you're studying something twice. In case you're a Chad or a Karen, this is a joke. So a binary base doesn't use 10, it uses two. This is because most semiconductors, basically the things that make decisions inside your electrical device, have two possible states. Either it can conduct electricity or it can block it. So computers have a much easier time understanding things in binary. Nowadays, computers have been coded to be much more user-friendly, so though it thinks in binary, it speaks in our human language. So what does a binary base look like? One important thing to think about is that we're only counting up to one before we decide to group the sheeps together. That is, the moment we get two sheeps, we're going to go get another stick. So our zero stays zero, and our one stays one, but two becomes one zero, three becomes one one, and then four becomes one zero zero. In general, if we're thinking in base n, we use n digits. 0, 2, and minus 1. It's basic stuff. So what now? How can we ever trust that the number 1, 0 is really the number 10, not 2 in binary, or whatever in any base? Well, to make things easier, we usually assume that anything written plainly like that is in base 10, otherwise known as a decimal system. Dec means 10. Think December, but some Roman dude messed it up. That's right, if you've ever heard of decimal point before, that's where that name comes from. I'll talk more about that later. Anyways, if we do want to indicate that the number is written in some other base, there are several ways to do it. One of the methods is to say that you're writing things down in a different base. Another way of doing it, if you're lazy like most mathematicians, is to use a handy small print after the number, like that. This tells us that we are in base 2. Now, we'll get into a bit more rigor, because in order to talk about divisibility rules, we have to have a little more understanding of how bases work. As we already established, a base is a system of writing numbers, where each digit represents how many groups of a certain power of the base we have. For example, if we have base n, then writing down the digits 4, 3, 2, 1 mean we have 4 of n to the third power, 3 of n to the second power, 2 of n to the first power, and 1 of n to the zeroth power. In other words, 4, 3, 2, 1 in base n is equal to 4n to the third power plus 3n to the second power plus 2n to the first power plus 1n to the zeroth power, which is just one. And I get it, this looks disgusting. Terrible. No good, very bad. But it's actually a lot simple than you might think. If we're thinking in base 10, then 10 to the third power is just 1000. 10 to the second power is just 100. 10 to the first power is just 10. This is basically everything you already know, but more generalized. That's right, it generalized. Again, mathematics is all about making things generalized. And if we really want to continue with our generalization, we should think about what happens when we continue going down below 10 to the zeroth power. This is where the decimal point comes in. The decimal point indicates that we are no longer working with whole numbers in our base system because each digit that comes after the decimal point is a representation of the amount of 10 to the negative somethings. For example, the first digit that comes after the decimal point is how many 10 to the negative first power there are, or 1 tenth. The next is how many 10 to the negative second power there are, or 1 100th. And we don't usually think like it because the base system we live in and the number are so intertwined with each other. We group numbers into their own respective hundreds and tenths and tenths and hundredths. We don't usually think about the numbers as 
themselves. A good example of this is divisibility rules. We can take them at face value, but they are super dependent on the base system we are using. The reason why we can add up the digits in base 10 and see if the number is divisible by 3 or 9 is because every digit represents a power of 10, and every power of 10 is one more than a multiple of 3. We can see this by expanding our number out. If we write down the number 1, 2, 3, 4, what we're really saying is the number 1 times 10 to the third power plus 2 times 10 to the second power plus 3 times 10 to the first power plus 4 times 10 to the zeroth power. Now 10 to the zeroth again is just 1 so we don't really have to worry about that. Now remember what we talked about last episode. If there's a factor in one of the things we're multiplying by, there's a factor in the whole thing we're multiplying by. We're going to extend this logic just a little bit. The thing to notice is that whenever we have a bunch of 9s like 9999 9, 9, 9. and I'm not German we have a number that's divisible by 9 thus a number that's divisible by 3 this is because these numbers can be written as 9 times however many ones we need. Thus, because we have a factor of 9, we have a factor of 3, and the whole number is divisible by 3 and 9. But these numbers are just one less than the powers of 10. So we can effectively write our 1, 2, 3, 4 as 1 times 999 plus 1 plus 2 times 99 plus 1 plus 3 times 9 plus 1 plus 4. Now remember our friend the distribution? This allows us to write this whole expression as 1 times 999 plus 2 times 99 plus 3 times 99, so just taking the first of the sums, plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, which are what's left over. In other words, we have something divisible by 3 and 9 plus the sum of the digits. So in order for this entire number to be divisible by 3 or 9, we need the sum of the digits to be divisible by 3 or 9. But this technique doesn't work in other bases. If we are looking for divisibility by 3 in base 3, we're not summing the digits, we're actually just looking at the last digit to be 0 because every column is a power 3. It's the same thing as us wanting the last digit to be 0 when we are looking for divisibility by 10 in base 10. In general, if we are in base n and we want divisibility by n, we just want the last digit to be 0. And looking at divisibility by 2, 4, 5, and 8, we have a similar reason. The reason is that 10 is a multiple of 2 and 5. Because of this, any number that comes before the second to last digit, the tens column that is, doesn't matter. They can and will be grouped into twos and fives. So only the last digit matters. For four, it's because 100 is the first power of 10 that is a multiple of four. For eight, it's because 1000 is the first power of 10 that is a multiple of 8. This is why I separated digits from numbers in episode 0. Digits are merely a way to represent the numbers while numbers themselves don't ascribe themselves to a specific base. And going back to the thing I talked about in the last episode, this is why prime factorization is so powerful because it is base independent. Now we have an idea of what base is, we know what being base independent means. This means that no matter what base you are in, the number still has that property. For example, if I want to write down 25, we can write it down in base 10 or in base 2 where it is 11001, which is 16 plus 8 plus 1. Even though they look different, both are the result of multiplying 5 times 5, or 101 times 101 in base 2. In other words, if we know a number to be 5 to the power of 2, we know exactly what that number is, and we can even use this information to figure out what base we are writing the number in. But wait, there's more. Prime factorization is more powerful than giving us a unique way to find unique numbers. It can also help us figure out what things two numbers have in common, and prove that there are an infinite number of prime numbers. But this, and more, will be discussed in the next episode, Quick Maths. For now, thank you all for joining me on this mathematical journey, and see you all next time on Let's Math It Out. Now, to prove this, we're going to do something called 
proof by contradiction. Now, you probably know the answer right away. You probably even know the song. Like the end of our last episode said, this is where prime factorization comes in handy. Whether the variable is part of the problem, the solution to one, a representation of a number, or the crucial element in a proof, variables are variables. 